think it's uh, very important to see what happens after events like the Fort Hood massacre because what we find is that Muslims do an outstanding job of pressuring people uh, to keep them from examining the true teachings of Islam. Now, what we find with the group Tigers for Israel is this is a Jewish group, obviously a pro-Israel uh, group. And what happened was that they had scheduled a former Muslim speaker, Nani Darwish, who was an apostate. She, she left Islam. Uh, they had scheduled Nani Darwish to come to Columbia and Princeton universities to speak to people uh, about Islam. But just before Nani Darwish was about to speak at these schools, uh, her presentation was canceled. Now, people who are, who are uh, wondering why she was canceled, uh, we automatically assume that Muslims pressured the uh, administration of these universities and that these administrations um, canceled the event. But uh, what, what the facts revealed was that it was the Jewish group themselves, the Jewish group, uh, canceled the presentation. And let me explain, uh, let me give their uh, explanation as to why. Here's what we have from the president of Tigers for Israel. <clears throat> On Tuesday evening, Tigers for Israel and Wig Cleo rescinded our co-sponsorship of today's Nani Darwish lecture. Tigers for Israel accepted the opportunity for her to speak based on a misconception about what she actually believes. After her anti-Islam position was brought to my attention on Tuesday afternoon by the Center for Jewish Life director, uh, Rabbi Julie Roth and the Muslim chaplain, uh, I conducted extensive research and discussed the issue with Tigers for Israel and with Clio leadership, and we, dis uh, we decided to rescind our co-sponsorship after concluding that Tigers for Israel disagrees with and does not condone Ms. Darwish and her beliefs on Islam. As president of Tigers for Israel, I take full responsibility for not vetting Ms. Darwish from the beginning, and I sincerely apologize for offending any person or group on campus, especially the Muslim community. Tigers for Israel deeply, regret, deeply regrets the initial sponsorship, and we do not in any way endorse her view. So here you have a Jewish group saying we will not allow uh, anti, any anti-Islamic comments or views. Uh, we will not sponsor this sort of thing. We, we don't want this on our campus. A Jewish group saying we don't want a presentation on what Islam teaches because we will not tolerate that sort of uh, anti-Islamic uh, or Islamophobic uh, sentiments on campus. Now, the reason this is disturbing, especially for, for anyone who's studied the Muslim sources, is that uh, what Muhammad taught about the Jews is very, very disturbing. Just let me give you a, a few quotations from Muslim sources, the Quran and the most reliable hadith, about Muhammad's view of the Jews. In Surah 551, O oh, you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians for your friends. They are friends of each other, and whoever amongst you takes them for a friend, then surely he is one of them. Surely as Allah does not guide the unjust people. Do not become friends with Jews. 564. And the Jews say the hand of Allah is tied up. Their hands shall be shackled, and they shall be cursed for what they say. Nay, both his hands are spread out. He expends as he pleases, and what has been revealed to you from your Lord will certainly make many of them increase in inordinacy, in inordinacy and unbelief. And we have put enmity and hatred among them, the Jews, till the day of resurrection. There's enmity and, uh, in, and uh, um, uh, hatred among the Jews until the day of resurrection. 582. Thou wilt find the most vehement of mankind in hostility to those who believe to be the Jews and the idolaters, the biggest enemies of the Muslims, according to the Quran, you will always find to be the Jews and the polytheists. And let, of course, we can't forget uh, Surah 929 and 930. Surah, according to Surah 929, Muslims are commanded to fight both Jews and Christians. And the next verse tells us why. It's because of our beliefs. Jewish and Christian beliefs force Muslims to fight us, and the Muslims are told to fight us until we are subjected to Islamic rule. Now, uh, in the Hadith, we find some, some other interesting things. I'll just read uh, two or three very quick passages. Uh, according to Sahih al-Bukhari, once the Prophet went out after sunset and heard a dreadful voice, and he said, the Jews are being punished in their graves. If you hear a, a strange voice outside, it's because Jews are being punished in their graves. Also in Sahih al-Bukhari, Allah's Apostle said, 
The hour will not be established until you fight with the Jews. And the stone behind which a Jew will be hiding will say, Oh, Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. So kill him. So, I mean, p part of the goal of, uh, of Islam is to ultimately conquer the Jews to such an extent that Jews are hiding. They're hiding anywhere they can. And where they, wherever they try to hide, uh, inanimate objects are crying out, Here's a Jew. He's hiding. Come kill him. These are not unreliable sources. This is Sahih al-Bukhari, and it's multiple times. It occurs multiple times in Islam's most trusted sources. So I would ask uh, any Jews who may be watching, are you against these claims? Are you against these claims? Are you for these claims? There are only three possibilities. You're either for the claims, or you're against the claims, or you really don't care one way or another. You're fine with them. Uh, but what we find from Jewish groups on campuses is we will not allow anyone to speak against these Muslim views. Well, wh what are you thinking? What, what could you possibly be thinking? Are you saying that you will not tolerate anyone who denies uh, that you're going to hell? Uh, that, that Muslims should come and fight you, that Muslims should conquer you, that Muslims uh, should force you and subjugate you uh, to, uh, to either accept Islam or to pay them for the right to survive. Is this what you believe? Or are you against these teachings? If you're against these teachings, why are you stopping people who want to tell people and warn people about what Islam teaches uh, concerning the Jews? And when I, when I saw this, when I saw what was going on, I was, I was reminded of uh, a writing by a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust is a very famous book. Elie Wiesel in Night describes uh, his experience in the Jewish concentration camp at Auschwitz. And what's most disturbing to me about this entire ordeal was he didn't have to suffer at Auschwitz. His family and, and, and his town did not have to suffer at Auschwitz. Many of them were killed. A few of them survived. Elie Wiesel was one of the survivors and he didn't have to go through that. Why? Well, not long before the entire town was rounded up, the Germans came and took a number of Jews away from the town, hauled them off in, uh, in cattle cars, and one of them ultimately escaped. Because what the Germans did, they took them out, forced them to dig their own trenches, and then killed them all. Well, they shot one, a man uh, named Moisha. They called him Moisha the Beetle. Uh, they shot this man, and they left him for dead, but he survived. And he didn't want to live anymore based on what he had seen. The only thing he wanted was to get back and warn his town about what he had seen. So he got to the town and he kept warning them and telling them, I'm telling you what these Germans are doing. They're taking us to kill us. No one believed him. No one believed him in the town. What do you mean the Germans are coming to do this? The Germans? They're the most enlightened people in the world. They're producing the best symphonies. They're producing the best plays. They're producing the best scientists and phys physicists. How could these people be coming to round us up in, in a barbaric fashion and send us off uh, to kill us? Th th this can't be. You're, you're, you're ridiculous. And let me read um, a brief passage. Um, Moisha wept and pleaded, Jews, listen to me. That's all I ask of you. No money, no pity. Just listen to me. He kept shouting in synagogue between prayer at dusk and the evening prayer. Even I did not believe him. I often sat with him after services and listened to his tales, trying to understand his grief. But all I felt was pity. They think I'm mad, he whispered, and tears like drops of wax flowed from his eyes. Once I asked him the question, why do you want people to believe you so much? In your place, I would not care whether they believe me or not. He closed his eyes as, as if to escape time. You don't understand, he said in despair. You cannot understand. I was saved miraculously. I succeeded in coming back. Where did I get my strength? I wanted to return to Saget to describe to you my death so that you might ready yourselves while there is still time. Life, I no longer care to live. I am alone. But I wanted to come back to warn you. Only no one is listening to me. Here is a person who could have averted many deaths, but no one listened to him. And people suffered because they simply refused to listen to the facts. And what do we find in the world today? People have not learned from history. And here in the United States, anyone can open up the Muslim sources, read what the Muslim sources say, and you can see how violent they are and the result that will be from the spread of Islam. And what we find is that even Jews who, who are going to get the worst of it from the Muslims, they're saying, we do, want, we do not want to hear this and we will not tolerate anyone speaking against Islam or speaking the truth about Islam on our campus. Now, if that's the view you want to take, I, ju I just want to say two things. One, 
Future generations could suffer because of what you are doing right now. Future generations of Jews, if you do not act, could be suffering because of the decisions you make right now. And two, uh, if this is the path you're taking, we will not tolerate anyone speaking the truth about Islam. That's up to you. Uh, but please don't call yourselves tigers for Israel. Uh, dimmies for Muhammad uh, might be a more accurate term. I'm not saying that uh, to insult you. That's just what you're doing. You're being good servants of Islam, not allowing the truth of Islam to spread. And that's what good dimmies do.